what's going on, everybody? It's another episode of Don't Quit Your Day Job. I am your host, Maxim Allen. Today is October 17th, 2021. I am just back from a overnight trip to Rhode Island to visit my good friend, Connor Kafia Chain. Check out his episode. I was doing his uh, curbside comedy show, which was a blast, and I can say that I've never performed for so many old white people at one time, <laughs> but it was still a lot of fun. So I'm happy to be back, and I'm really excited for today's guest because they are a fantastic comedian and, uh, what I just learned, uh, a writer as well. And so we're going to talk about that. Everyone, please welcome Juliana Marr. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a really good podcast voice. That Thanks. was very, very professional. It was a good <laughs> rhythm. I'm very impressed. It has taken your episode 61. Wow. I, I will say it feels like every time I do that, I like get a little bit, just a tiny, tiny bit better <laughs> at it. But I feel like the best part of podcasting is talking to someone else. But when you're talking to yourself or just the it's audience, it's like the hardest part. It's like the robotic thing, you know. That makes sense. Yeah. I don't know. It's like uh, it's like reading your jokes off your phone instead of performing your jokes. You know. Yeah. Kind of oh, same oh, idea. Yeah. Yeah. But or yeah. doing your or practice trying to practice your jokes in the mirror at home. Ooh, do you do that? Um, if it's for <laughs> like for roast battles, usually roast battles. Like okay. places like that. That's. Because, you know, that's like harder to practice at a mic or something. Right. Yeah. I yeah. <laughs> I practiced some roast. I did a roast uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And then I was practicing those roast jokes at mics. And it would be like, OK, who here knows this person? Right. Exactly. It's it's I, I've seen people do that. I haven't done roast in a while. You know, and I'll do that also. I will practice them for I have some bits that are um, that are like very long and involve like long, like they'll involve long lists. Yeah. Or that where. It, I really need to get the rhythm right. Those I will do over and over because even doing them on a mic, it, it's too much. It's too long. Like it's too much. It's, <laughs> I have to get like I just have to memorize the order. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. I feel like like a, a big list that that takes time. Yeah, yeah. Or like when it's, I, I like or jokes where I have like fast talking, really big concepts like about science, where I'm just like da -da -da -da. And the audience <laughs> isn't supposed to totally process it, but I need it. To, I'll yeah, I got it. I, I helped someone shoot a sketch and they gave me like a huge line. They're like, we shot yeah. this line with like 10 different people. If you're the one who gets it, <laughs> great. If you're not, that's also well, fine. Can you tell us what the line was? Um. Oh, my God. OK, so it was my buddies, uh, Jack and Matthew, who are also in this podcast a long time ago. But they did this sketch about they w like they it was like on the street interviews for a made up New York mayor candidate, mayoral candidate. That's kind of funny. I like so that. they were like, what do you want in a mayor? And there was like a bunch of people like, what do you want? They had some ridiculous line. Right. And so they had a bunch okay. of they had a bunch written out and they had, they were like, you can ad lib one or two. We'll, and then we'll it. cut it all together into like a commercial. Mm -hmm. And oh, my God, it was like it was something like I want a mayoral candidate who's going to break up big businesses because uh, pr there's a and then there's like this name of the business which is all sciencey and weird and sci-fi and out there but it was just so fucking long and then they're like and then on every corner and we need to break them up or whatever and i, I like oh that's funny yeah, i had to like practice it like 10 times off camera just a bunch of tape but i, I eventually did okay but i get i get that yeah yeah <laughs> the joke memorization i know people who will do like 10 minutes in the mirror like just do their whole 10 minute set i mean that's probably good i'm sure that's a i you know what you know what i have done that for well, mm. timing although it's super hard because obviously timing is different but i've done yeah. that like when i've when i've had a very specific like if i've been working on a new set that i mm. haven't gotten to practice 10 in the 10 in the mirror is hard i usually have done that for like when i'm trying to alter my type five and right I, you know like right before <laughs> 10 is a lot of time in the mirror <laughs> it's a lot i i feel like even when i first started i couldn't do that but it was just i'm like am i gonna talk to myself i'm just gonna go to an open mic and make these people suffer through yeah. my learning <laughs> through, through you also talking to you, yeah so talk to yourself in a basement talk to yourself in a basement not a mirror yeah. <laughs> talk to a spirit talk to a ouija board practice your jokes yeah. in front of a black candle <laughs> don't don't do that <laughs> it's it's halloween month so oh, it's yes, on it's on true. theme yeah um so yeah you are a uh writer's assistant right now is what we're yeah. going to talk about today yeah so when when are the when's the origins of you like writing as like a hobby slash profession as a hot, like I started writing when I was like nine ish, like mm -hmm. quite young, and I was like a weird kid, um, and I like who who 
was very intentionally precocious, which is the most obnoxious kind. Okay, um, what does precocious mean? It's like it's like smart, but it's where it's for, it's for children, so it's like where they're, um, it's like being mature but intellectually mature. Like, oh, okay, yeah, I got gotcha, you, I got gotcha. yeah, like precocious children is is tend to like kids who are are child prodigies are very precocious. Not okay. all precocious kids are child prodigies, right. but. A precocious kid move is being like, I'm reading The Odyssey and I'm 12. Yeah, yeah, or like any any little girl in a romantic comedy movie, that's probably a precocious kid. Okay. Like, any, like Abigail Breslin as a child exclusively play, portrayed precocious children. Okay. Generally, <laughs> all kids with like major speaking roles in film and television are pretty precocious because if they weren't, then they wouldn't be interesting to the plot. True. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. People are always pointing that out there. I was like, most three year olds don't say that. And it's like, yeah, but you wouldn't want to listen to what most three year olds have to say. <laughs> most three year olds. Like you want re- you want run. gritty realism of the preschool hour, really? Like what <laughs> that that really that gets on my nerves sometimes when people are like, Well, kids don't always talk like that. And I'm like, No. <laughs> but also like, do you hang out with them? <laughs> yeah. It's like they just like a, a real three year old on camera just runs off camera. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's why every three year old who every three year old you see is played by a six to seven year old. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, okay, for a second I thought you said sixty seven year old. Oh no, that'd be interesting. <laughs> that though. would be interesting. I think that'd be a real shake up in Hollywood. Yeah. Uh so you get into writing when you're young. You're are you like a literature kid, like every English cl- English class you're into it or um... I mean, I definitely liked reading. I wasn't as much as I think I would, I, as you might expect. I li- mm. I liked reading, but okay. it wasn't like super into the classics or anything. Okay. Um, but I started writing a lot, and I start so I start, I wrote my first like quote unquote novel when I was like nine ten. Ooh, um, it was, was about it? A, it was about a hundred pages in text edit. Um, <laughs> it was called Navy Child. It was called NYC. NYC. K Inc., um, which did for Navy Child Kidnapping Incorporated. Um, and it was <laughs> a novel told from the perspective, it shifted three times, of three different sets of twins. Um, it like, or no, two different sets of twins. It shifted between them. Um, who, but basically, it was about um, how the Navy kidnapped children of the super rich who were otherwise avoiding taxes and held them for ransom as part of a government program and then kind of devolved into a toddler male beauty pageant somehow. Oh, wow. My interest somewhat shifted, apparently, during I, the writing of I that. Fe- I feel like uh, tax avoidance is a big theme for, like, a 9 or 10-year-old. Yeah, it was. that's <laughs> precocious, obnoxious, yeah. obnoxious and precocious. That, I mean, that was, like, obviously completely unreadable. I wrote, And I wrote two more that were, like, totally unreadable. Well, yeah, I mean... Do you totally st- unreadable. Do you still have them? Sadly, the first two I don't, and I really, I actually like that makes me really sad because, like, obviously they're unreadable, but like that would have been cool <laughs> to have, right? Just like there's so it's so hard to get in the mindset, like to to access what you're actually like because you know, memory is so weird, and and our memory with childhood is so weird. We, we remember ourselves so differently. Than we actually were to have something like that where it's like this was actually what was in my mind would have been pretty cool to have yeah. from that young of an age. Totally. Um. But that computer died, unfortunately. Ooh. Yeah, that was very traumatic. It was the same. It was a. It was like we got it when it was super old because it was my own laptop. So it was like it only could do Word. It was just basically only yeah. for writing. And uh, it was actually the exact same one that Carrie Bradshaw has on Sex and the City. And hers also dies. <laughs> like very similar things happened. Oh, all of her childhood fan fiction out the window. And I learned, <laughs> but I and I learned to back up. Like I religiously back up all of my. I mean, now most people's stuff is on the cloud, but I religiously. Started backing up after that, but <laughs> but I did that, and then I wrote I wrote three more that were just like very complete self, you know, as children, of course, like children do, like like self wish fulfillment type right, of stories. Right. And then when I was in like eighth grade, is when the fir- I wrote the first thing where like if I were ever to like have people look at it, I would need to obviously do a page one rewrite. But where I'm like the concept was solid, like the it was it was it was it was, it was it, it, I can go back and read it and be like this is readable. Okay, so what was it? Um, it was about a kid who's uh like a twelve year old kid whose dad, like after his mom dies, his dad basically like has kind of a breakdown and takes him out of and as he, he well he's still a baby. Okay. Um, 
and it kind of takes him out completely outside the world and doesn't really let him interact with people at all and raises him in this very specific like everything focused on kind of like education and and totally isolated and then his dad suddenly dies okay um, wow yeah so it's about him um you know going having to mm-hmm. deal with that so you're you're coming home from school every day and are you just like pounding away at the keys to get these things written or that one kind of that one actually i wrote in about four days okay um I I have ADHD and that was before I was on medication and I've been told that that was probably an example of like hyper focus that that's probably what that was right right um somebody later like I think if, if an adult did that it would generally be mania but in a in a kid that young they were like that's not that's not what that is that's <laughs> that's, that's, that's not what that is how they're like you are just poorly supervised <laughs> <laughs> how long was it uh, like two hundred oh sorry I uh, like a, like 250 pages i think 240 maybe i i'd have maybe it was 200 i'd have to i'd have to go back and look that's so long yeah it was i i was at a i had realized like right around then that i was like that if i did outlines i could write really fast Mm -hmm. um and so i was it was kind of a thing of like wanting to see like how fast i could do it wow yeah that's that's okay uh the longest thing i have ever written was like a ten page essay in college. Oh shit, really? <laughs> yeah. And I wrote I wrote a bunch more stuff. Like I I wrote um that is one of the only ones that I would say has like actual solid like a decently solid plot. But I wrote like five four or five more. Mm-hmm. Um one that was like one that was like basically it was really more of a um I think it, it was an outlet during my like ninth grade year of high school. Yeah. Like, I was a bo- I went to boarding school. Okay, um, and was just like super unfamiliar with like the social dynamics of the East Coast and girls. I had most of my friends have been boys, and it wasn't an all girls school, but I was living with girls, which is unusual for me. Um, and that book was like four hundred and fifty pages, and it was legitimately <laughs> just like like um, oh, I'm blanking on the word, but like um, not mythology, but it's it's like when when cultures or communities take like real stuff that's happened and they make it into metaphor, like with religion, there's a, there's a specific word oh, for okay. it. I don't know. Um, but I go like, talk yeah, about. yeah. Like prophet, like prophecies are generally in this form. Like, um, so you're, you're making your experiences in this boarding school, like into, into a, a super, a into a, like a, yeah, like yeah. a, yeah, but yeah. Um, that one was, that, I think that was the longest thing. That was, there's tiny bits of good writing in it, but yeah. like, zero plot wise um how how long did how long did it take you to write that one was that over that the was course, over the course of, like of longer year? that was okay. like six six months maybe. so that was kind of like a, a, a journal yeah. almost turned into a narrative yeah, kind or? of i mean that was actually it was like i did it was plotted out it wasn't it wasn't a journal mm-hmm. but um but it was over a longer course of time for sure okay um so when you're writing this one are you like are you active, like, during this time of when you're young and you're writing these things, are you actively trying to improve your skills? Or are you yeah, just writing? Yeah, for sure. I okay. really, I definitely, I really wanted to, I was very set on being, which would never happen, but I was very set on being published before I got to college. Okay. Like, having a novel published before I got to college. Okay. Again, did not happen. Um, <laughs> but I did, like, research it, and I did send out, like, several dozen query letters, which... I did. And I also like. I actually had for a long time, and I used to carry it around in middle school. In the seventh grade, I wrote a short story um, that I submitted to the New Yorker, and they very nicely like wrote me back and gave me like a, a very sweet rejection letter. Mm-hmm. And I like carried it around for a long, and it was it was very sweet. Um, <laughs> I mean, I said in the thing, I was like, my mom was like, "You should tell them that you're 12. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and that was the right call. That's, like, <laughs> that's a good call for sure. That's yeah, like, like you- tell the New Yorker that a 12 year old is sending them. <laughs> <laughs> that's like if you're gonna go to an open mic for the first time it's your your first time doing comedy you should probably say that so yeah. no one's like uh, you've been doing this for years and you although no. you know my first open mic somebody um i i lied and said i've been doing i said i had just started doing it but that it was i specifically said that it was not somebody asked me like mm-hmm. have you and i was like I, I i'm new i'm really new to it but i specifically said it was my first open mic because i i felt like people act really weird <laughs> like they're either like too encouraging or like 
or give you too much like unne- unnecessary or like unwarranted advice if it's yeah. your very first one for okay. some reason. That makes sense. It's probably a smart call, actually. Yeah, I think that's. I, I think I feel that especially as a girl for some mm. reason when when a girl says that it's her first open mic, there's like a whole weird reaction. Um, yeah, so you were like, you were I was just <laughs> like, I've been doing it. I had not good, but I haven't been doing like I haven't been doing it long. But like, this is not the first time. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to give me advice. Everyone else has already given me all the yeah. advice you're gonna give. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you submit to the New Yorker. You're like, yeah, but I was, I was trying to, get, I was trying. I mean, less so in high school because I went to this boarding school that was like really, mm-hmm. really intense, and so I had less time. Um, but I wanted, yeah, I was definitely like in, very intentionally. I wanted to do that for. I knew always that I wanted mm-hmm. to do that for work. And you're always gravitating towards like writing fiction. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, and then it, as a younger kid, and then in high school, in the tenth grade, there was the first time there was a twenty four hour. I've always like really liked theater, mm-hmm. um, but there was a twenty four hour play festival, which is a really great thing. I think every high school should do it, um, where it all takes course over twenty four hours, and basically there's there's a predetermined group of like actors, writers, directors, and it starts at like I don't know like eight or ten p.m. They all you come, you talk. Like they send the directors and the actors home. They take all of the actors that have like printed little like pictures of them the writers sit and basically you draft like a, like a baseball draft you get to pick your actors mm-hmm. then the writers work overnight they work till like 6 a.m then they send the writers home the directors come they have an hour to like read for it's like a 10 minute play obviously okay. this, these are high schoolers so like yeah you would not want anything longer than that um <laughs> and then the directors come they do they like spend an hour deliberating they get to pick their scripts and then they rehearse all day and then the show is like at, at eight or, t- or something and then the whole so the whole thing is is performed and it, it's really fun especially when you're in high school that's have, cool so you you got on as a writer at that? yeah so that okay. was the first and that was the first time i had ever done like any playwriting or anything like that and um and i liked that i did that two years in a row and then well i did it all three years mm-hmm. um and what were your projects like which what'd you write the first one to be honest i don't really remember i know it took mm-hmm. place in therapy i was also like i was i was nervous about that one because i was i was like the youngest writer there were no freshman writers that year so i was like and i was like a, a 10th grader um and and they were always funny. Like there's usually there was usually like every year there was usually one person who tried to do a serious thing and it didn't really work because everyone yeah. sleep deprived and because it's like high school audience. So I would just, <laughs> so I did one. I it was about therapy. I can't remember what it was. Um, and then but then the next year I actually did not a funny one. I like uh, I did one that was about it took place like out of boarding school, but or like a yeah out of boarding school. And it was. Um, and I still like this. I think that I use this. I use this actually for my college applications. It was one of my. It was one of my writing samples. Um, it was, but it took place like sometime, vaguely in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, two boys who were roommates at boarding school, um, who are in a in a relationship secretly, and they're talking about their relationship as one of the boys' mom is there, talking to him, basically telling him, without saying it exactly like. I don't like this boy. You need to keep him out of your life. Mm-hmm. He's like saying without saying it. Um, and and that like, I was nervous about it because like, again, like it, and then it had like really positive reception. It was great. Like people, mm-hmm. people really liked it. It was wonderful. Um, and that was when I was first like, oh, okay, this is, I have to do this. This is, this is like, that was the first time I was like, this is better than writing fiction. Like this okay. is, this is so much cooler. Interesting. Yeah. So- I was like, it was, cause I saw it was the first time I saw like something I had made and I was like, this is what I wanted it to be. And mm. it was there and I saw people reacting to it and I was like, this is amazing. This is what I want. So you, you like the, so you switch from just writing something to be read to writing something to be performed. Yeah. And I okay. was like this. Yeah. I, I, and that was huge. Just like turning point. And after that, I started writing plays as well. Um, I wrote a full length play that that we I got to do. Um, I got to have perform at my high school, which was very cool as as a senior. So you're like you're like serious into like writing at this time. Yeah, yeah, that was my thing. I was everybody at my school was pretty serious into like academics and whatever they did, and that was definitely my thing. Okay, um, that's fascinating. So like, yeah, I. I was always, I was never a writer kid. Like, oh, I, yeah? I couldn't do it. Like, even, like, in the comedy world, I am interested in writing. Right. But, like, long length stuff or, like, big papers, I hated it. I was, like, yeah, math science. That but, was definitely, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I was very into the writing, the long, 
long stuff. So, but like for writing these like long things like these plays, like you do this overnight um, performance in this twenty four hour thing, right? Yeah, that so, that was just for ten minute plays, right? So yeah. you you do the first year, it goes like okay. The, yeah. I'm, were you thinking about what you were going to write for the second year? The you're, whole gap in no, between. No, no, you're really not supposed to. And part of the reason mm. that you don't know which actors you have beforehand is to prevent that. Oh, okay. Is, gotcha. Yeah. So like. You could, I mean, like, you can, obviously, you could think of a theme or something, but, like, you, you really, and you don't get to, like, you get to choose, but you draft, and so, like, you don't know what the ratio of, like, guys and boys and girls is going to be, like, you can't, like, like, somebody right. would, the best one, mine was probably, like, the best one in our 11th grade year, and the best one in my 12th grade year was by a guy who's a, who's a great actor, and he is a great writer, and I think he, and he's still a playwright, um, Andrew Schlager, and he wrote, his was just, like, fantastic, um and he wrote one that was really really good um it was it, uh, not about affirmative action but about like three people reacting to college decisions or awaiting mm-hmm. college decisions in a way that was, it was very like it was great mm-hmm. um and you he couldn't have come in with that idea because he couldn't have known that he would have gotten those right. races of people right like okay. it was very specific like you could tell that like he couldn't have had that really had that concept because he right. it wouldn't have worked if he had had any girls basically like because of the way it okay interesting yeah. that's cool i think that's like a yeah it's, it's a good like way a really to keep fun, people like really it sounds like a really fun exercise it's too. super fun like nyu has a version of it that's like the 72 hour film something okay which is great. I mean, I might have, I might I might have liked it more then if I had been more into like film then. Right. I I like it less just because as much as I love film and television, like I don't really think it's fair to have any kind of competition like that where people are using their own money in a, in a student case. I mean, obviously that's life, but like I they use their own money in this. Yeah, Ugh. exactly. And it's like film and television, so like always the winner. The winner is just always amazing. I don't right. know you. It's like the MMIU film school. It's always an amazing shoot, but like some of them are like cost. You can tell cost like tens of thousands of dollars. It's like well, yeah. As opposed to at least with like a play, you all have the same space. Like some people like right. there are also a lot less, a lot fewer injuries <laughs> when you do a play in twenty four <laughs> hours than try to shoot a short film in seventy two hours in New York City. Yeah, definitely a significant number of kids got hurt doing that at NYU. I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, NYU kids should get hit by cars and stuff. They should get hit by cars, <laughs> but like, it should be for other reasons. Yeah. Damn, <laughs> that's, that's wild, because I, I feel like that's something that like, the school itself should be like, we have budgeted this much for these yes, short you films. Would Each team gets this much money. You would you would really think. You would think. Yeah. <laughs> NYU, uh, I, I went there for undergrad. Okay. Um, uh, b- and I, I had some amazing teachers mm. um, and I'm trying to, I'm running through my mind now if this could get me in trouble, but I'm not connected with them anymore. Um, they're like, NYU in general is, in my opinion, like the most, one of the most egregious modern examples of for-profit colleges marketed as not-for-profit. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I, I, I honestly, I don't think it's that big a risk. I think that there are professors who stated that to papers, like to the newspapers. I think that, I think that's a, not that controversial a stance. Um, I thought so of, it does not yeah. really surprise me that they do that because they don't, they don't care. No, they don't. It, it's insane. I, yeah, I like, they, they, they're, uh, what, one of the things that like frustrated me the most, mm-hmm. one, like everybody had specific, um, during like when Black Lives Matter, when big corporations and, and institutions were coming out in support, right. everyone had different things where they were like, oh, this drives me crazy because you you actually know this. Yeah. And when NYU did it, I was just like, you cannot say that you like care about racial diversity, in, especially in America anywhere, but like especially in America, and be like, and we're not need blind admissions. Like right. that's inextricably tied. Generational wealth is inextricably tied to racism in this country. Like right. anything else, anything of just being like, well, we're really committed to like racial diversity, but but also you can only come if you have this much money. I'm like, that's you don't care. It's crazy. Yeah. I and like you said earlier, I didn't know they were a private college until yeah, I came yeah. here, and I was like, that's so weird. A lot of people are like, wait, isn't that a state school? And it's it's. Yeah, it's it's one of the most egregious. It's not only one of the most expensive, but one of the most egregious examples of just like of low paying 
mo- professors who do most of the teaching and like crazy benefits in real estate for very select high up people. Yeah, and they 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 also like I heard that they own the most property of any any organization or anything in they the entire do. city. They do. They're like I think they're they're like the modern Robert Moses. If you but that's a whole other yeah. tangent. But you know, like the the guy who like yeah. ruined <laughs> lots of New York City and a lot of communities of color and like. Yeah. I'm like NYU is the modern Robert Moses. That's <laughs> I truly, NYU is it building makes sense. a beach. Like, there was the ro- there were protests against Robert Moses in Washington Square Park in the 50s. That's mm. on Maisel, and you you can. <laughs> and now there are protests against Washington uh, Washington Square Park against NYU. It's and fascinating. It's really, really, I think it's a one for one. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, but so um, we were talking about uh, how much we hate NYU. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say just. One the one one of the reasons I went to NYU that which okay. for me yeah. was a good thing. I ended up I'm glad that I went there because I got very lucky. I got a lot of scholarships, like mostly merit scholarships, which I was great for me, but I strongly think is a bad thing on principle. Set that aside. Um <laughs> But part of the, the reason I went there, I'd really not heard of Tish of the of the writing program there. Okay, yeah. Um and this guy who's a director and writer, his name's Craig Lucas. Um his film and and play and he came to my high school which is one of the nice things about going to like a fancy boarding high school they had a lot of they had mm-hmm. some cool people came and he like he was going to meet with our top theater kids who were we called them producers um and he was like are there any kids who write here and i was kind of the only person who had like written a following play so he just happened to be really interested in that at that moment yeah so i met him and he was great and he read my stuff and he was like you should go that you should look at this program and he so he like wrote a letter of recommendation for me for that. He was sent by the school. <laughs> yeah, he he you no, know, he I mean he actually he yeah. said there in Yale and I also applied to Yale but I didn't get into Yale. Yeah. Okay. I just like to bring that up because I've not fully accepted it. But That's okay. I didn't get into my dream college either. Yeah. I, I have... It's for the best. It's for the best. I think I would be less likable if I had gone to <laughs> Yale and I'm already not that likable. If you so... went to Yale, you would have a whole spiel about how you how much you hate Yale. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, that's true. But at least Yale's need blind. That's all. I'll say that. I'll say that. <laughs> Yale's got many problems. At least they're need blind. I was thinking about this too. That is just stupid NYU shit. I was walking through Washington Square Park and it's like, you know, it's like the beginning of the fall semester around mm-hmm. now. Like it was like a month or two ago. And the park is full of these NYU kids who are clearly freshmen. Yeah. And I kept, they all dress so crazy. And yeah. in my mind, I keep thinking, you should not be allowed to dress punk if you can attend NYU. That is like, very true. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> It's a weird thing. I, I tried to write a bit about it where I was like, I think um, freshman orientation for NYU students should just be euthanasia because <laughs> there is nothing worse than people trying to find themselves out in public. <laughs> Aww. I like that. I think it well, I think it could be cool if you could only go to NYU if you went to a New York City public high school for one year. Whoa. Like after you graduate from wherever or even, you know what? F- fuck that. One week. One, one week. week. You have to last one week at a New York City public high school. If you can do that, you can go to NYU. <laughs> you have to let New York City I, that public would cut high attendance by you. like ninety yeah, percent. Right. I think that'd be great. <laughs> just let just let public school kids in Brooklyn like deal with them. They will be gone. <laughs> that'd be amazing. I, I couldn't make it. That that would be yeah exactly. That'd be a great orientation. Like be wonderful. I, yeah. Like so, this is how you adjust to the city. These are these are people who are one year younger than you, and they will beat you up <laughs> with words. Like they're not going to actually touch you. You're just going to feel terrible. They're going to roast you in the most specific way, and it'll stay with you for years. Yeah, you'll you'll learn really fast how to pronounce Towson. <laughs> okay, so you go to NYU for college. You do the Tisch writing program. Yeah. So when let me like when you're doing this, you. Are you now thinking I'm going to write plays and or TV? At the beginning or... plays, yeah, I was definitely very set on plays, and that that changed pretty quickly. I really, I realized. I mean, like, I, I still do plays and I still write write plays, but mm-hmm. um, but it changed that. I, at first, I was very certain that I wanted to concentrate because I was in, one of the things that I do like grudgingly. I like parts of Tish. I did not like MIU, but I will say that I like parts of Tish. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I like is that, and I think it's very unusual. I think most kids should not do this, but it's for kids who really are very, very sure of what they want to do. It's mm-hmm. really rare to be able to concentrate that much on a craft at that, at that age. Like most right. colleges you have to take at least. And I think that's good. I think you should do like 
what da, 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 like curriculum. But like, if you really want to learn something that's a very like craft based, I think most of the time people should do it as as in grad school, frankly. Right. But because of the way my high school worked, it was it was almost it, it kind of functioned a lot like a college. The last two years of it, like I came in with with about two years of, of AP credit. So, oh wow. Okay. Yeah, and that was just like, and that wasn't like me being impressive. That was just kind of like how my high school worked. Right. Um. So it. it for me, it was nice because I kind of are, I had kind of done a lot of that, and I really wanted to get to like specific skills, um, and that was nice. Right, that's great. I yeah, think like, I do appreciate that. Like they had, um, like when I went to engineering school, they mm-hmm. of course had you do the gen ed. So right. like every semester, you had to take like a humanity class or something. Yeah, and all of us were like, "Why do we need this?" Right, and I think that like to be honest, I think that that is like it's a really good idea on principle. But it, no one has figured out how to execute it yet. I think it is a real, yeah. I think it's, because I think it is vital, like, people, I think part of the problem is that they they, they make them gen eds, yeah. as opposed to, like, because I know, I've known, I worked in finance, actually, right out of college. Oh, wow. Um, so I've <laughs> known. <What>? Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll come we'll back around. We'll get there, yeah. yeah. But, so I've known a lot of people, not, obviously, those weren't engineers, but I knew a lot of programmers and, like, yeah. people, like, like and engineers and programmers and like finance people absolutely need humanities but they aren't gonna in my opinion like my non-educator like Mm. i have no authority to say this like opinion having them take like greek philosophy courses is not gonna do do that right like they should i think that there should be classes that are shaped around communication for people in those professions because there is vital like there should be like engineering based communication type classes that is yeah, yeah. pertinent that's like how to communicate how to like how to communicate with people who are scientifically or numerically illiterate that right. would be great everybody who majors in stem should have to take like multiple of those that would be a great humanities requirement like yeah. how to communicate statistics with someone who's never taken statistics That'd be great. It'd be, I like, mean, it'd be awesome. And yeah, but th- like Oedipus, less so. Like, <laughs> yeah, the, my thing is, it's like, okay, you like to get the degree. Like, I went to college to get a job in a specific field. Right. I knew it. And I was like, why make me take all these extra courses, which I'm not, I'm going to absolutely annihilate because they're just not hard compared to what I'm doing. And on top of that, I have to pay for them. It's like if you right. want me to, if you want to require me to do a gen ed on top of the thing I really want to do, yeah, like don't you should me. just toss it into the bundle. You should it should be free. If I right. take if I take that's 16, a good point. Yeah, yeah that's that's a good point. It's, it's like if I take twelve to thirteen credit hours of engineering, throw me four of humanity and say it's free and it's required. And I'll yeah. be like, all right, I can accept that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a good. I mean, I think college should be free anyway. But it should be. <laughs> it should all be free. Actually, but yeah, I, I do think I do think that like one of the biggest mistakes is like. I think the people in like STEM would would respond and care way more about like humanities classes that were applicable to them rather Absolutely. than just being like that's the thing about gen eds is they're gen eds they're not like yeah it's I think there's like something like, to it like you need to be able to write you need to be able to communicate but like that's not how those people are going to be able to communicate no it, it's insane like my my first company out of college all the engineers I was the most extroverted and yeah, I was that like. Makes sense. I was like, what on earth? Like, you guys don't talk to each other? You don't chill? Yeah. Like, just, I don't know. Get out of your bubble a little bit. But yeah. it's a whole thing. I don't know. So, I mean, you were it's saying... It's tough the other way, too, because I think people feel that way very much. Like, people in humanities feel that way very much about, like, why am I being made to take a math class in college? Yeah. And it's like, <clears throat> I mean, that's a whole other thing. We could talk for, like, an yeah. hour about that. But, yeah, so you... you uh, you mentioned that you got to focus really hard on writing. Yeah. You didn't. You didn't get bogged down with gen eds. You just got to go straight into what you yeah. wanted to do. Yeah. Although I also did choose to double major in economics for some reason. <laughs> um, this is a kind of kind of a smart idea. It was. Yeah. It was good. I'm glad I did it. Like I've I've always liked both. Like I've mm-hmm. always not been to- only a humanities person. I've always really liked math and I like science. I was not as good at science as I was better at math than science. Okay. Um. But like I loved calculus. I think mean, calculus, calculus is like dope. I think calculus is beautiful. I think mm-hmm. I've I've I got in fact at NYU I like one of my teachers had to like stop me because I was trying to explain in a writing class like in a in our freshman year like screenwriting class I was like no it's not about like math it's beautiful like this is what velocity is it's amazing <laughs> and then everyone was just like shut. Up. <laughs> but I tried I think oh you know what I did I tried and then it, in conference I was like. 
I would not let it go in conference with her. I was like, no, okay, look, there's this is amazing. Like you can think about the concept that you can add something forever and it will always get bigger and it will never get bigger than one. <laughs> and she was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, that's amazing. That's what the characters are talking about. She was like, no. <laughs> like breaking news, 18 year old tries weed for the first time. <laughs> I was just like, I was like, this is what an infinite yeah. series is. And they were like, no. <laughs> no, yeah, it's not going to cut it. <laughs> yeah. But like, I, lo- I really love, I love calculus and I love like back stuff. So, um, and I really, I've, one of my biggest loves is like statistics. Yeah. I really, I loved econometrics. I did, if, if I had done something else, like I probably would have, if I had like gotten a, like a master's or something, I probably would have wanted to get an econometrics because I think that's like, mm-hmm. One of the most, I think economics gets a bad rap for good reasons. And I think one of those reasons is that most economics as taught and as talked about are like theory, but Mm. not even modern theory. They're like, basically, they're not really economics. It's history. It's a history of economics that's taught. Like you get taught all of this stuff and it's good foundation, Mm. but it's, but most people only get that foundation because most people take one course if ever. Right. So like what you learn from economics is like, here are all the things that were not helpful. Right. Which is, (laughs) which is important. Obviously, if you're going to have like a long career in it, you need to know what has, you don't, you not Mm. reinvent the wheel, but like most first years, even first two or three years of economics that in the way we teach it is, History of economics. It's not. Right. It's not economics. Right. It's like the invisible hand stuff. And right. Like, it's, it's here, here's what it's, used to. Right. Used or to it's think. like learn. Yeah. It's like, and you need to learn like supply and demand. But like, so many people I know are like, well, economics doesn't work. And I'm like, well, yes and no. Mm-hmm. Like one, no science, especially no social science, works 100 percent of the time. Right. Like, and also part of a reason for that is that like the way most of us talk about and try to use economics is not grounded in economic theory <laughs> right like modern economic theory. right so w- w- you're I'm not saying it would work i'm saying we don't know <laughs> is the is my point about this on this podcast about being a writer's assistant <laughs> but everybody should learn statistics be be mathematically literate it's good it's really so you're you so you major in writing yeah in in screen t- i concentrated in it was dramatic writing and I concentrate I ended up concentrating in television writing. So okay. I started in playwriting and I still did, but the I will say like and nothing against like most of the teachers and, and nothing against the kid, but playwriting even at MYU, which is like a, a very you know, as we were like insinuating, like a very right white rich school. Yeah. And Tish is also, of course, and um and I think dramatic writing can be even more so well, dramatic writing is about on par with Tish. Um but even within that, I would say playwriting, much like play audience versus TV audience, like attracts. We I know that I noticed we would we would comment that like not all of the kids in playwriting, but one of my friends who was in playwriting who did not come from a lot of money and was working a lot of jobs. She was like, most of the people in playwriting are people whose parents are going to be able to produce their own shit. Right. Now she was exaggerating. That's not true. Right. But like. That was the vibe I think that a yeah. lot of people got. So I was, I think that was part of why I was kind of pushed okay. away from it. That's interesting. So I was about to ask you, like, while majoring in like t- TV and screenwriting and like the playwriting stuff and minoring in economics, what was, was like? I was already double majoring. Oh, double major. Yeah. Right. So what what's the duality like going between these two two it was, different it was worlds? Very funny. I really enjoyed it because like mm-hmm. they were just such completely group different groups of people yeah. who have like who I was just like these people will never interact now or in life like, <laughs> <laughs> like it was just such different it was it was yeah it, but it was it was helpful for me I've always kind of liked that because it's a nice for this is less relevant to me now but like for when I was like studying it's I, I've always found it helpful to have both just because like if you are writing and you're having a really hard time and like there's nothing worse than just like staring at a blank page and like not then you can do econ you can do math and it's like fuck yeah there are answers and there's like i can study and if i work hard enough i can get it right and then like the other side of that is like if you do econ and then you suck at it and you like fail or you do something really like you you get a very like jarring and an objective measure that you did 
poorly right then you can be like i'm an artist i don't need this no one can judge me no <laughs> one knows what's in my soul like it was it was a good way of just like what if you got without getting too discouraged like being able to switch off interesting did like well this is like fast forward a bit but like do you have something like that now in your writing do you have like a hobby or something that is more analytical and definite I do a lot of research. I mean, I do a fair amount of analytical stuff, but also no, and I think that that's tough. Um, not like this to the same extent, but okay. you can't. I mean, you just can't have two careers, obviously. Right. But yeah, I think I I feel that out somewhat by research, doing a lot of research for for like the stuff that I'm doing for the stuff I'm writing. But no, and that's it's it's tough. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that, I think that's like a that is a really good duality to have. Yeah. In, like especially in school where. Yeah. Like the pressure is high in both of those, but yeah. one can help alleviate pressure off the other. Exactly. That's cool. Yeah, that was nice. Yeah. So did you did you write anything like? Did you have any? Uh, what was your uh, your call your undergrad uh, highlight reel for your writing? Do you have like a greatest hit that you wrote? Like, I have. Yeah, we have. I mean, we did, and we have. I have um, two pilots that came out of that. One one better than the other. Um, neither of which I don't know if I would use either. Though I, I wouldn't. I might. I might use one of them as a sample now, but I would need to go back on it. It's, but also it's it's been like five years since I've been in college. So right. Like I would hope that it, my college sample would or my college like what came out of it wouldn't <laughs> be um, wouldn't be my sample right. anymore. Were um, were other people in your program also like? I, let me ask you this as a side first. When did you get interested in stand-up comedy? Uh, when I was in finance. When you were in finance? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I was just like, everyone here wants to kill themselves. I need to do something else where everyone wants to kill themselves. Okay. Um, so, yeah. on top of that, now, I, I think in the, the writing world, because I'm the, the way I know about the writing world is through stand-up comedy. So, yeah. in my mind, I Most think... Most stand-up comedy people I know are that way rather than the other way around. Okay. Because mo- like, when I think about it, I'm like, Every writer's room, even for drama shows, must be full of stand-up comedians in some way, right? No. No? <laughs> There's people who just write who just aren't Oh, funny? yeah, the majority. I mean, they're funny, but they're not stand-up. They don't perform. Okay. They're not they're not performers. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I mean, even on like Maisel, which is literally about stand-up comedy. Yeah. Um, only half the writers and neither of the showrunners are comics. <sighs> Is that frustrating for you? No, not at all. That really? is so needed. Really? Yeah. And I, I, not to be, most stand up comedy writing is so different than writing television. Right. And it demands, it demands a schedule that a lot of, that not many, like the comics who I know who are writers are great writers. Mm. Um, like the ones who are professional writers. But a lot of the comics I know who want to do writing, I think would be good at it. But they haven't like it's a very different structure and just lifestyle okay. than doing comedy. Like sometimes, sometimes people will be like, "I want to like start paing," which is how a lot of people get started in in television. And I'm like, "I will try to help you do that if if I know you and I can." But also, like in in my mind, when people say that, I'm kind of like, "I don't know that you." really want to do that i think you might think that you want to do that but like do you really want to work 14 hour days standing outside doing nothing like getting coffee for people for the next like two years as a chance to be a different kind of pa for right. them where you are getting doing the same thing and then like you you give up a lot like working in television especially in fact this is very relevant now because we were um there was going to be a strike that was mm. started at midnight night the atsi strike um which was huge and if there's a whole Instagram page. I implore people who work in television or want to work in everybody. I think people who work in television have seen it because of the strike. But of, I I love working in television and I love my job. But mm-hmm. it's a good like kind of sobering. Just like it, it's just stories of of kind of. I mean, it's extreme stories, but stories of abuse of people and just like the okay. what's the intensity. Strike? What's the strike name and in the Instagram so people can find it? Um. So it's called so Ayatsi is and it's that's a nationwide. It's a ton of different unions. It's it's the theatrical and stage hands is is what the name is in, but it's it now covers film and television. It's like 130 years old. Okay. Um, I how do you spell it? I A T S E. Okay. I A T S E. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah, so yeah, go find that. Go yeah, and that. Uh, the Instagram that I'm thinking they have their own Instagram, and there's also an Instagram that's been the strike has been really public called I A yeah. Solidarity. I A Solidarity. Okay. Um, 
but yeah, but I, I think um, like working in television and working like when you're working on a show, mm-hmm. it's very hard to also do stand up comedy. Right. Like the Maisel writers, part of how they're able to do that, like how they're able to get right stand up comedy people to even be writers, mm-hmm. is that they have scheduled time off for touring and shows. Because, Interesting. Because if they didn't, like, that's the thing. That's the tough thing about like employing a stand up comic as yeah. a writer is if they're, is if they're, like as we know, like in stand up comedy, like there's so much of it is about momentum, is about staying right. on, like not just not like a million people were on late night last year, right? right. No one, I mean, not no one cares. Like obviously, I would be through, but like for people who are at that level, there are a million people who are on Fallon last year. Like right. the fact that you're on Fallon in 2020 doesn't barely doesn't matter if you're like a professional full-time comic right so what matters that you're touring or like what is next or if you have a thing come so if you work on a show it can be great but if it's not especially if it's not like a super famous or successful show or even if it is that's you kind of not completely but you can't tour you can't go on the road right that whole time right so then then you'd kind of come back into it and you've been working these really long hours really long unpredictable hours Mm. so you've been still doing shows but you've probably had to cancel a lot of shows you've probably like haven't been able to stay out right. as late um, and so like a show like tough. Miss Maisel if they didn't allow that time off they It'd wouldn't be harder get, for them to attract they wouldn't get comics. comedians on and then people would be like why does the stand up comedy fucking suck in the I th- show I think they would get <laughs> comedians on but they would just not get as good comedians on yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true I think they'll, they'll always be people who would like to do that but I, I, I think like they wouldn't be able to get people of of the talent that they do because all of I mean right. all of the Maisel writers are amazing and this, the comics are all great comics in addition to being great writers and but like I'm really in awe of how they balance that mm-hmm. um, because they're they're so demanding and like they seem like they go together but in a lot of ways like they have very conflicting lifestyles. Right. Interesting. That's that's really fascinating. Yeah. So. So you, you you graduate college, you start working in finance, yes. and then you start stand up comedy at this time. Yeah. And then yeah. you I'm how do you I'm guessing how do you find comedy writing for your own stand up, having all this writing experience in the background? Does it just kind of come naturally or did um, you have some challenges? Yeah, no, kind of it, I mean it's very different, but also like I never really did acting, but I was always a very like attention seeking, like I had a very per a class like younger child like of parents who are doing a lot of other stuff like very classic like i think is true of a ton of comics just like always performing as a kid for attention right um, okay like i have early memories of like i think of this as like where i'm like oh it makes sense that i do stand up now where i was like nine ish um i would um do these like long improvised bits basically i mean mm-hmm. that but to because i realized that like if my mom and her my mom had would have a lot of friends over, she was kind of like partying a little at that time, which is cool. Yeah. Um, and they would be like, you know, drinking and, and smoking weed and stuff. And so I realized that at that time that obviously they wanted me to go to bed because they want me to go to bed anyway. Also, because like you don't want to really have a little kid around. Um, and I realized that if I like I could if I if I could in- keep people entertained, if specifically if like people would be la- were laughing, yeah. then I could stay up longer. So I would do that. Like I had like whole bits. They were all about like being this. They were like this cowboy character. I don't know. I don't know. But like <laughs> I would had whole things like that. And now I'm look back on that. I'm like, oh yeah, that makes that makes, that sense. makes sense. I'm surprised that I didn't do it sooner. <laughs> um. So you enter the you enter the comedy world, and you're yeah. this is your first time like really performing. Yeah, yeah, what definitely. You've written. Yeah. What, how and how long were you in finance? Did you say? Um, like. A, a little over a year and a half. Okay, and then yeah. so you start stand up, which was good. I got to pay off. I, that's how I paid off a lot of MIU loans, and I got. I did have. I had some savings, which that's I feel perfect. like gave me. I I'm super grateful for, um, and I feel like gave me a lot more flexibility than most people have when they're starting out. In that's film like a television. really start solid plan. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it wasn't. I mean, I would have worked in film and television if I could have first. Like I tried, yeah. um, and I didn't. Did just didn't get any jobs out of college, so that. It's just what happened. So you Um, just went for finance. So, but but I'm glad. Like I was, I am glad, and I feel really lucky that I was able to to do that. Mm. I think few people have that if they're not able to like have a lot of support from their parents. Right. So when you're doing that during that like year and a half or whatever, you start stand up comedy. 
And yeah. then are you continuously looking for TV film yeah, jobs during that time? Yeah, pretty much the time? whole time. Okay. Yeah. I, I actually really liked my, like, I liked in working at finance a bit. I actually, I learned, like, do you code it at all? Uh, I have coded. I'm like a, I learned, like, the most laughable, like, baby like um like like macros but just the code for it right yeah right, like that's yeah. it but but for me that was like i had never done coding at all before so yeah. and that was really i i really liked it it was the only i've i've always sucked at languages like like it's been really always that's one thing in school it was always kind of harder for me mm-hmm. um and i interestingly I, coding was like a thing where i, I felt more natural to me I'd, yeah you just picked up the logic of it pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. It, w- it made a lot more sense to me than like other languages. That's um, fun though. Yeah, it's like and so a... like, I really en- I loved that. That mm-hmm. was super satisfying. Mm-hmm. Um, like streamlining process. Like I enjoyed that, but everyone around me was like, I was just like, everyone hates their lives here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was working at Citibank. Um, yeah, and and also I could do an entire podcast episode on Citibank and why you should all be very very afraid. Um, and it's not for the reasons you think like everyone's like so worried about like insider trading and all this stuff and I'm like that's real but also did you know how much just incompetence there is (laughs) and super outdated technology Mm. I will say I'll keep this very limited but the one thing I will say is that as a as like a Citibank analyst um, I one of the things I did was I would type out into this transmitter these we would get trade requests like requests for records of trades from like the sec and, and FINRA, right. like securities exchange commission and i would type the trades out by hand <laughs> into a computer every day oh my gosh like and no <laughs> one was checking that whoa i was a 22 year old art student crowd <laughs> and there was literally no one between me and the securities and exchange commission like what i typed went to the sec (laughs) you should be afraid oh my gosh (laughs) yeah that's horrifying yeah that's really scary (laughs) yeah one one time i was like i was they would let you like learn i was like i want to trace a trade from like when a trader makes the trade to like when we get this record Mm -hmm. and and they were like we don't know how to do that they truly they were like we don't we don't know how that we don't know how to do that they were like there's what they said was they were what was I was told by multiple people like there's no one person who knows how it goes all the way through and I was like that seems bad yeah <laughs> it seems like there should be a law for every step of the way or something yeah like... you would think yeah <laughs> wow yeah. okay so, so it was so the whole time I was there yeah I was um I was applying and just not getting anything and uh, one of the things that's um I also one of the best pieces of advice I can give for mm. anybody who wants a job in television or anything like that. Um, I think this works in general, but especially in television is, and this is really hard to do because it feels really entitled and, and, and just gross when you're doing it. Okay. But is reach out to people, like do it and ask, well, before you reach out to people, find out specifically the names and titles that you want of jobs you want and have ready like examples of like what shows and what directors it feels weird to do that because it feels like how could i be it feels like you're being entitled to be like i have no right to say like who i want to work with i have no right to name like the show run i want to work with right or or even the job like what most people will do is they'll they'll message someone like me or or someone above me and they'll say can i talk to you and they'll just kind of want it they'll be like can i ask you about your experience Mm -hmm. and that is not a good way to do it in, in my opinion because that doesn't really mean anything once, but like when some, if someone tells me like, like if, if somebody tells me like, I want to be an office PA, if you hear of any office PA jobs, will, will you put me up for them? I might be like, sure. And that, that might be a little brusque, but I guarantee that like most jobs in film and TV and entertainment in general, like I think this is true stand up too, like go so quickly and are so about like who is available right now. Right. Like when people say like, cause like I do get asked about, for people for jobs but it's never like send me someone in a week it's like someone's right. walking down the hallway they're like shit our art pa has to like just got poached to another show we need someone by friday do you have any names and they want names like then wow okay so like because it's just like other because otherwise so you just if, have to do it. if someone hits so, you so up if somebody has said so like if someone has said hey i really want to be an art pa if like my unit production manager is like oh, we need someone i'm just like i will be like that's so much more helpful for my brain. Like, I'm not going to remember right. somebody who's like, I'd be interested in anything. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, and I don't remember that. 
But if you, yeah, like knowing one of the things I think that Emily that Tish did poorly was I didn't know the title of script coordinator right. or writer assistant. I did not know what either of those things did when I left. Um, when I like got the when I was got the interview for the to script coordinator at Nickelodeon, like I googled it and stuff, but like I was I did not I didn't really yeah. realize at all. Um, so like just learning learning the titles of what you want the specific jobs and having ready like what kind of shows do you like and what mm. kind of shows do you want to work on having those ready and and honestly this is like knowing who the showrunners are or on films it's easier because it's like directors and writers but right on on tv knowing who the showrunners are and it's on imdb but um knowing who the showrunners and executive producers are of shows you want to work on is to me pretty impressive because most people, even even people who are writers, tend to only know the actors because those are who you see, right? Right. right? Um, and sometimes people know directors mm -hmm. because those are big names, right? Right. But a few people know showrunners. Like I couldn't, I like this is bad. I, sh I should know. This. I couldn't name the showrunner of like Lost, or right, actually right. I couldn't know the sh I couldn't name the showrunner for Friends. Yeah. Like, and I should really be able to do that. <laughs> um, I mean, I feel better because I was younger than I. But yeah, yeah. But you know what I mean, like. Right. I can name actors on those shows. So like, so like, if your your advice in a concise way is like, hit if you're gonna hit someone up, know which shows you would like to work on, and know the positions, ready, yeah, and have and ready who like the people who work on those shows, who you would like to work for. Yeah, basically. exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, that but, that I think is like that's really solid advice, especially because yeah. I feel like the world is it's so hard to conceptualize how to break into that world it's so hard without yeah. like like we all go oh yeah it's like you either work super fucking hard or you join a writer's group or you know someone there's like a tiny bit of nepotism or yeah. you're just not in well, there's like, not a tiny bit of nepotism there's, there's, there's a, a ton, lot, of nepotism. ton of nepotism yeah <laughs> yeah so that that's amazing advice yeah so that's really good so what so you even and i would say just even knowing the name of jobs makes it feel more like you know what you're talking about right right so yeah, just being specific yeah. and just getting familiar with that yeah. world. Okay. So I would also say if you're ever talking to someone who does work in in the field, like, and they're using terms you don't know, e unless you're unless it's a job interview, um, you stop and if you can stop them and ask them what those terms mean because right. it, I, I I never used to do that because I didn't want to seem like and I still am guilty of that like if someone is talking about stuff on set I'll just yeah. pretend I know what they're talking about like. <laughs> Because I don't want to seem like I don't know what's going on. Right, right. But it's so valuable. And then like you have like those things when you have them later, it's like it's they're like code words because then when you use them, people know that you know. So like right. it's awkward and a little embarrassing. But again, not in a in a job interview. But if you're talking with someone and you possibly can, and they're like, Yeah, no, our like script supervisor, and you're like, What what oh sorry, what what job is that? Is that like yeah. connected to the right? You like if you can. Yeah. I asked that's you. Great. I asked you what precocious meant at the beginning of this. Interview, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's um, good. That's good advice. Yeah. Just, like it's, I, it's so hard to do. Like I'm bad at it. I my my current job. I've been there two years. Uses an insane amount of acronyms and mm -hmm. like a lot of interchangeable words. Totally. And if you don't ask every time they come up, even if it's multiple times, yeah. you're gonna forget it, and totally. then you're just gonna have to relearn it like eight months later. Yeah, so, ab absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's good advice. Yeah. So what you're you're in finance, you're applying for TV jobs. Mm -hmm. Um. So you, what what's the first interview you land that where you get the jobs? Like what's how do you get that your first a, writing job or script coordinator? Yeah. Job? That so that was a Nickelodeon show, and I will say um. When we were in college and during the time I was applying for jobs, then I asked, you know, like everybody I could. I was like, how do you, how did you get your first job? And right. this is what everyone, and everyone said luck and connections. And I was like, fuck you. That's so unhelpful. Yeah. And <laughs> when people ask me how I got my first job, the answer is luck and connections. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's other stuff, but like, um, th that's, it's true. It all, but it also like connections don't act, they aren't they're not necessarily what you think of as connections. Like right. when people say connections, they often think of like being someone's son. And right. like obviously that's a great way to do it, but like that's not necessarily what it means. It's like meeting someone who can give you a packet or something in, in right. some cases. Or even just like meeting someone who can like who works in the production office who can put bring in PAs. Right. Like um but my, I hit up literally everyone when I was just like going for broke. Basically, I, everyone I knew just being like, "I need, I need a job. Um, I really want to do this. I'll do whatever." And my 
one of my professors who I was with for several years, who's fantastic. She's a great, great writer. She was working at Nickelodeon on a different, on a preschool show. And she was like, would you be interested in this? I'll put your name. And I was like, yes, this is great. Um, I really did not think I was going to get that job. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't realize, I really didn't think I was. I now know it was crazy that I did. Like I thought, (laughs) I I didn't even know how unlikely it was that I was going to get it because generally to be a script coordinator or writer's assistant, most people are, at least, like, often they're a writer's PA first. Okay. And a lot of the time, people, even starting as a writer's PA, is, like, very lucky. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, people work in, like, an office PA or a set PA or that kind of thing. And then they get, like, they work on that show for a year or sometimes multiple years. Yeah. And then they try to get a writer's PA position. And then if the script coordinator or the writer's assistant moves out, they can sometimes get that job. But even then, they can't always because... Part of the gatekeeping of the industry is mm-hmm. no one wants to hire anyone who hasn't gen- done the job before. Right, right. Ever. Um, which is impossible because someone of has logic. To, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but so I didn't realize I I knew it was on I knew it was on like, but I came they gave me like five of the episodes before I watched all of them like eight each of them like eight times mm. in the two days before and I like sketched out one like i like sketched like did it out like the structure i like had like a pitch for an episode which i didn't i knew i wasn't but like i came on very very strong right um and i really did my homework so like that helped and Mm. i was i i have to be like fully honest that i was very lucky that it was a first-time showrunner and he was just willing to take a chance on someone who had not done before okay yeah um i think it also there was circumstantially it helped because they had had a ton of problems with organization and kind of keeping stuff together so i was able to sell the fact that i worked in finance and like was really good with that stuff mm. it was actually very helpful yeah um because you, you you prove that like you can uh function in a in a professional work environment exactly and not yeah. like lose your shit or you're not just someone they pulled off the street who's like i work right I just work in restaurants or whatever. We, then, right. Then, but even, yeah. even that you can shape it. Like I think a lot of people don't realize True. how much uh, being an assistant, in my opinion, especially a PA, I think that it's, it's very similar in a lot of ways to being in the service industry. Okay. Interesting. And if people who are like, like so much of it literally is, is similar to the service industry. I mm. mean, one of the most important things that a writer's PA does because they're getting lunch for – a lot of the top people so yeah. it really has to be right right um is and you'll i noticed this like it can you can always spot someone who's been like a, a who's been a good pa or like an assistant because they will when they get um food or something they will look at the receipt and they will check the number of items before they leave the restaurant mm. um like i th- i i was yeah. never even a writer's pa but i um but i have i've like subbed and like we all kind of do that stuff and like i was at a bar um uh like six months ago and they were closing up so i i closed out my friend's card for them and i came and i was like hey i came out and i was like hey um i had to close out your card because they're closing here's your card this is the receipt i tipped 20 if that's okay um they also could send i could send it like electronically and they were like i don't care about any of this <laughs> but it, they were like yeah well, you can just you have assistant energy like you just are like but, but a they're lot like, of actually, that Juliana, is, you're fired. Yeah, but a, but a lot of that is like my friends who are like bartenders and stuff. I'm like, they have a lot of those skills. Right. Um, that, that's interesting. That's really cool. I think people, I think people, um, are undersell like how much like if you have experience in a New York restaurant. In my opinion, you have a lot of similar skills to being, especially like an entry level assistant. Okay. Um, that, I mean, that's because so much of it is just like being generally competent with people who are unreasonable yeah and that's yep. what the service industry is <laughs> right yeah you can you can interface with lots of different types of people you can yeah. take their orders right you can and you get... can you can pretend it's your fault when they have done it wrong right that's what, and that's one of the biggest things of being an assistant and i think that like be yeah being like clerical office work and service industry is a ton of that yeah absolutely um, but yeah in this specific case it was i think it was it was helpful that i had like yeah yeah that but but yeah that's just my my pitch. I always am like, I think that's a it's an undertapped. Um, I think people with experience in the service industry is is a very undertapped resource in terms of assistance. I think they should really hire more people mm. who do that and fewer people who go to film school because yeah, I think the people in the service industry tend to have better like <laughs> capabilities of doing the things that assistants actually they have tend to, do. to have had jobs before. <laughs> yeah, exa- exactly. Yeah. So you you get this job 
you you have uh, luck and connections air yeah. quotes yeah. <laughs> you get this unlikely job what is your like first day at work like um i think the, honestly i think the first day of work we mostly did paperwork although it was fun working at nickelodeon because everything feels like nickelodeon really yeah like everything's brightly colored um the rest like the the lunchroom area is like called the fun zone literally they're like <laughs> pop up like um there are like pop up uh, cardboard things like of all the different characters like all around. It's like it's a fun. It's like mm-hmm. a fun place. It's definitely like different than most yeah. adult TV. So is that like a, a good like welcome start to the yeah, industry? Yeah, I think for it was you? really nice. I think it, and also it was just like it was a fantastic show. And it was a it was a tricky show for some reasons, but like, but it was yeah, it was very nice. So what what did what does script coordinator? actually do right so it it varies uh, <laughs> well on that show i was really and i didn't realize this at the time but i was really a combination script coordinator and writer's assistant okay um so and in that was a half hour animated kids show so it's actually a little different because there's you're not the way the scripts there work is a little different um but there my main thing was um taking notes in the room that that's what's classically writer's assistant writers like cla- in fact if anyone wants a really good um a really good rent like very specific rundown on what script coordinators and writers assistants do they just let me see if i can find it while while we're on here because they just because of the strike there was this whole thing that laid out people laid out exactly what would constitute scabbing or strike break- breaking okay so it's actually but it's really helpful if you're interested <laughs> in the positions because it's it's literally like you, Roles and uh, what people in the office can do and can't do that a writer assistant and a script coordinator do right. so let me see if i can all right you found it okay great so it's a medium article it's called guidance for showrunners writers and writers office support staff re W A and S C covered work in the event of an IATSE strike. Um, yeah, it's on Medium, and there's a lot of stuff about the strike, which is also good to know. But uh, it has actually some very, very helpful like breakdowns of exactly what work is and isn't. Okay. Yeah. So, when in, in in a broad sense, what is script coordinator? Yeah. So, script coordinator in general is they're the person who electronically puts out the script okay they're the person who proofreads the script okay. they're, the, they're the last person to touch the script before it goes out basically okay um the script coordinator and writer assistant often work closely together mm-hmm. um some shows do not keep the writer assistant past the point of a writer's room so there'll be a writer's room in pre-production some shows the writer's room will continue on so they're there and, and working through production mm-hmm. um some shows the writer's room ends before production um the writing never ends before production, but the main writers leave and it's just the showrunners or the showrunners and one or two people. Okay. Um, the script coordinator, but there are changes throughout the script, as you can imagine, mm-hmm. to the last day of shooting. Right. Um, the script co- so there the script coordinator is the person who proofreads that and with the writer assistant checks for consistently consistency and continuity. Some of that's the script supervisor. Okay. Um it's more like the early stuff before the script supervisor is involved with continuity that the that the script coordinator will do that, but like, well, like, and if it's a period show, script coordinator and writer's assistant, lots of research. Like for Maisel, we had so much research. Maisel is very in- intricate. I right. did um, my the script coordinator and I on that, who's she's phenomenal. Um, and Grace Critchfield, everyone should hire her. Um, she and I worked really closely, and I would do basically like a timeline because. Mm. We're working in the past, and every day on Maisel actually takes place on a real day. Right. Um. So I actually had a physical printout, 1960 calendar, mm. and every episode was like tracking like this is when this like this is when this gig starts. This is when we said that the kids are going to be coming back from this thing. Like Whoa. all of that. It's a lot. But if you don't do it, then you'll get very rude comments on IMDb. You get a lot of plot hole. Yeah, videos. you get a lot. Yeah. So like that's a big <laughs> that's a big big part of it. Wow. I didn't I didn't know that that blows my mind cuz yeah. it's like crazy cuz like yeah, you really appreciate when shows pay attention to the details and don't let a uh, loose thread go. You don't think it's someone's whole job to yeah, it's a put lot. all those together. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, it's a, yeah, that's, a, that's a lot. Um, the script supervisor does some of that too. Once you get into shooting, they're the person who does that with like in real time, which is even harder. Like Whoa. I can't imagine. Um, uh, so that, yeah, research like, and making sure just that you know the show really well. Like the, it's a, mm. one of the biggest things is it's the responsibility of the script coordinator and writer's assistant, I would say, especially both. 
of if you're in the room and someone is pitching and or someone goes on the board that's like, this person has been an only child their whole life and they're going to find their long lost sibling. And you have to be like, actually, we said in a line of dialogue two seasons ago and then offhand like that they were going home for dinner with their sister. Wow. It's like we can't do that. That is because the writers and the showrunners are, don't really have the ability to keep all of that in their heads. Sometimes the writers have only been working for one season, so they've seen it, but like they haven't internalized every detail. This is insane. Okay, yeah, so that's, you that's a big part of it. You know this show like front to back with all the details. Yeah, like Amy and Dan like I, on, on I, Mesa, one of the things they'll be like, "How old are the kids again, Juliana? Like, how old are the kids?" <laughs> so it's like it's like I could be like, "Oh, like in like season one, episode three, who are like the main characters, the episode or something like that." You could probably, probably yeah, I could probably write. um season one. I didn't. I mean, I didn't work on season one. Okay. I could certainly. I I I should know that. I would need like a minute, honestly. Um, but you, I could do, I could certainly do that with anything in seasons three and four. Wow! I won't so do a season four. Just, it's just not out yet. <laughs> you're almost like I, I I'm imagining it's like you're being paid to be like the psychotic Game of Thrones fan. Yeah, that yeah, exactly, the fan exactly, like, exactly. Um, interesting. And I will admit that in times when we've had like very like random sticky stuff, I have actually found fan forums that have helped answer questions that we could not <laughs> could not figure out or remember like. Something where it's like it's a thing that you can't search for in a script because it's like a sign that wasn't scripted that you don't know where it is in the episode. And um, there's people who have, there's some, there some crazy people who have helped us out. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Interesting. That's, that's like really cool. So does, so for you, since you're just proofreading and doing this like coordination, like mm-hmm. do you, does this scratch your itch for actually writing or do you think script no, coordinating so the, is a step the, to the another thing? The fun thing about the best part of the job, whatever, like the real reason why you do it is because, um, not all script coordinators are in the writer's room sometimes they are especially if they are it's it's, this is and the writer's assistant always is is generally on shows you are allowed to pitch um like you're allowed to pitch premises which is a big part of writing most most of writing tv is not writing like not typing Mm -hmm. um some some shows like on mazel only one of our writers wrote an up wrote quote unquote an episode um, all of the rest were written by our showrunners. So you, oh, what? Yeah. So the Whoa. main thing that the writers on, on Maisel do is they break story, um, so, which is which is most uh, not most, but it is a lot of TV writing because it's a very collab. It's a much more collaborative process than people think. That's so one it's, of the things I like about TV writing instead of screenplays. So it's collaborative, but it's also high level, like where you're not sitting down yeah. and writing line for line. You yeah. See. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very much. Very much so. It's very. It's very collaborative. Like the whole first few months of the room are just like cards on a board wow and that's true like maze is a little unusual in terms of most i would say most most probably most shows most of the writers write at least one episode maze is its own kind of machine um but even so that means that on a on a typical show a writer is going to be writing a, probably a max of one episode wow that's right. fast okay if that or what, if not co-writing like i've thought about like like I'm interested in the TV writing world and I always thought it was like at the end of the day someone's going to have to sit down and just write every single line like you're just going to have I mean, to write the whole freaking thing so, I mean there's some of that for sure but often it gets rewritten by the showrunner because I mean that's the thing about TV shows is that they all have to be in one voice right 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 and so everyone is writing in the voice of the showrunner right it's it's not and it it couldn't be I mean it, it's not a good TV show if people are doing their own style Right. right. That, then you're watching a different TV show every week. In right. fact, I can't remember. I learned about this in school. There was some procedural, which is like a like a drama procedural, like like a crime kind of thing. Um, there was some or something like that from in like the 90s. And it was a joke among like writers because you could tell they had two. They split their writer's room basically in two, which sometimes people do. Like they'll have two smaller rooms just for like especially on shows where they have a ton of writers. so it, um, right. But they would have them write every other episode, and you could tell because they were different tonally. Like, one room would break something, <laughs> and it was, like, good, and then the other group that everybody thought was, like, we were the worst writers. I wish I could remember what show it was. That's so funny. Um, wow. Yeah. That you could you could just, like, you would be like, oh, this is the good writer's room. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Okay. So, wow. I, I'm, I'm so blown away by this. Yeah. So, yeah. the writer's room, they're just storyboarding with, like, high-level ideas. Like, so well, it gets it actually gets pretty. It can get pretty specific. Like often, like cards cards go on the board, right? And often that gets into dialogue, right? Um, like specific dialogue that's said in the room will often lay on directly in scripts, right? Okay, and that varies somewhat show to show, but like that certainly happens. So wow. So they'll and and also this is pretty much true of every show, just because it's how 
the the network processes ge- almost i think this is pretty as close to universally true as you can say that as you something is um there are three ba- major delivery dates um, okay. in in television there's story by there's draft by and there's final draft by and the final draft is not the final draft it's just the production draft okay um it's it's basically that is when it can go out it, it will change a lot and most production drafts do change quite a lot mm-hmm. um but that is when it can go out to like department heads usually okay um so story by is the outline okay and then so when you do like for story by usually most rooms i've worked on and this does very a lot but story by is the outline and you'll have cards in the room of stuff mm-hmm. that, like when something lands in Breaking Story, it goes up on a card, it goes on the board. Mm-hmm. Um, and often the cards will basically be a very loose form of the outline. And that's one of the things that we do like in terms of taking notes as a writer's mm-hmm. assistant is you're always ta- you're taking all the notes. And we create often these documents of that are basically like baby outlines from the stuff that's on the board and then other notes Okay, and that's one of the fun ways that we get to like influence. So not yeah, yeah. Sort. I mean, I don't want to like d- like influence is a little high word, but like mm. we we the b- most important part of it is finding what was positively received in the room, what what okay. worked in the room, what people liked, right? Um, and placing those notes relevant to stuff that made it on cards. Um, which is it, that is one of the hardest things to learn is to yeah. just, is learning just when it feels right in the room that people like it because very rarely will someone actually say, oh, that's good, put that in. Yeah, Um, interesting. So then all of those notes come, they go to the writer who's writing it, they do a take on the outline, but the outline is like, by that point, right, it's already somewhat even almost in paragraphs a lot of the time. Right, Or sometimes not, sometimes it's just bullet points. Okay. Um, So it varies how, sometimes it's they're taking really just bullet points, but usually they have, there's some body of mm-hmm. the, of the episode before you even get to story by, um, so the person who writes, who gets the story by credit, is usually coming in from that being broken in the writer's room. Okay, but by everybody, um, they per- turn it into an outline, and then it usually goes. Some shows it'll just go to the showrunners, but usually that will go to everybody, and everybody will give notes, everybody will punch, everybody mm. will get suggestions. Then the showrunners will do their pass. Then it will go out. Then from there, you get notes back, whatever from like network, whatever. All of that happens. It goes back to the person who's going to be the the writer, mm-hmm. and they and by this point in the story, by you have pretty much. I mean, it'll, it'll change, but you have scene for scene. Like you have scene headings that will be your scene headings in the script. Right. So you already really have a body of the script. You're not like well, when you get when you're done with story by. There sometimes you'll have to rework something. Cause something didn't work, or you'll have to add a scene because you forgot something. But often, like you're not sitting down at your computer like huh, what should happen in this scene? Right. You're thinking, how am I going to phrase the dialogue that feels in tone? Right. And how am I going to do it in the space allotted? And how am I going to do it in a way that like features our actors in the way we want to do it? Mm. Like you're not, by the time you get to writing a draft on a, on a TV show, unless you're the showrunner and you're like in your own, and you do your own thing and you're just a rebel, like generally <laughs> you are not sitting there like we would think of sitting down to be like, right. I'm going to write an episode of television. Like you are working from a recipe, and that you have right. helped that you have helped write, and then you are doing a kind of a different thing, a different a different part. Wow! Of writing. So it's like a whole organizational machine to create yeah. the script. Because it's yeah, I mean yeah, it's. I think one of the things that we forget about television is like movies take so long to make. Like if you think mm. about how long it takes or for people to write movie scripts for movie scripts to get made, it's so long, and like. Like, Maisel, like, those are almost an hour of television. So we basically, like, make, I mean, if we have, and if we do six episodes, that's, like, we've made three movies in, like, yeah, one and a half times what it takes them to shoot a feature. Right. Which is crazy. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes even faster. And so I think we for- we forget, like, how fast because we have this expectation that television will just always be there and we're like why does it and i i do right. this i'm guilty of this too i'm like where is bob's burgers like it's we forget of- that it's like it's like we it's it like think about the difference between um sequels and movies right of like we would never even when the plot is already there like with the harry potter movies like you would never expect the harry potter movies to come out one year apart 
That'd be insane. It'd be awesome. <laughs> it would be. It would have been. But like, but it it's takes like years, and in television, it's like months. That's like okay. It's so fascinating you say that. Now I'm thinking it's like I think it's so interesting because like yeah you're right on a TV show it's ongoing you have the machinery in place versus a movie where it's like not only are you pitching the movie and getting a green light from all these people and coordinating you're building the machine on the spot to build right. the movie as a and you're not and you're dismantling that when it's released right it's you're a not, very different yeah I mean I've and I've also I want a disclaimer I've never worked on a movie I don't want to speak with any authority whatsoever right. on movies. No one, no one get mad at me on Twitter or Instagram. <laughs> but it's still like, that's so I cool. No th- expertise. <laughs> it's so cool to think about. And it's like, I definitely, I guess it gives me more of an appreciation now for good movies. Because when you, like good TV, we were in, I don't know if it's technically past, uh, but like the golden age of like television. You know, when we, like, yeah, I don't know. I've never really understood. But yeah. But like, you know, when we like, when Breaking Bad was like, like when Breaking Bad ended and yeah, all the big right. shows that followed that where it was like. Why would I watch a movie that's only 90 minutes of plot and story when I can watch a hundred hours of like this TV series right. that's like so technical and just like amazing, you know? Yeah. But it's like, I guess that really makes a good movie stand out when you can just solo like, okay, we're going to do this one time and it's just going to be great. Yeah. You know? I don't know. It's yeah. It's so fascinating. It's, yeah. It's, I, again, I've never worked in film. I'll get, I, a, I'll get a film writer on here. Too. Yeah. Yeah. I would... I would love to to hear more about that myself. Um, and this is my totally uneducated. What I've like, my, or not just inexperienced, is what I've. My understanding is that it is in some ways that TV is more the arena of the writer. It's the um, I mean, it's the arena of the showrunner. The stage is the arena of the writer. Is like this is what we're t- we were taught this in school. It's like the stage is the arena of the writer. Mm-hmm. Television is the arena of the showrunner, who's usually also almost almost always a writer. Okay. Film is the arena of the director. Like okay. films have, and you can tell this because yeah. even great films like that don't feel fractured, they often have many writers. Mm-hmm. I mean, worse films tend to have more writers. Some films have upwards of sixteen writers. Um, <laughs> wow. And you can usually tell. Also, one thing that is just I didn't realize this until I worked in and in, in television is mm-hmm. that. Um, just because someone worked as a like was a writer and got paid like it wasn't like they weren't like screwed out of anything does not mean that they are on a, on, a, on a screenplay does not mean that they are credited as a writer. In fact, some people mm. write it into their contracts that they do not want to be credited. Like if someone's doing something for like, you know how we, we judge actors when they do a movie that's like clearly like, OK, someone needed to redo their pool. Like right. this is clearly a shitty movie. Writers do the same thing. They just have the the like the nice ability to be like have it written into their contract. They're like, I'll do a pass on this terrible, like, kitten's Christmas for, yeah. for this, like, great amount of money because you're from this huge studio. You cannot tell anyone I was attached to it. Interesting. They'll do that. And it makes, and it makes sense. So writers are kind of lucky in that way that, like, actors, what they do, they have to put their face on. Mm. And writers are a little more able, I mean, to some extent, a little more able to if 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 you're in a successful writer in a position of power, obviously right, that's not right. true for low level people. But um, that you have more control over kind of the narrative of your career in that way. That's really cool. Yeah. And for the listeners, I just want to say if you hate this podcast, I was not involved in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it's weird. Like I that never even occurred to me that. But like yeah, there. I mean, I guess I think some people are, are vaguely aware of that because you know people know of like about script doctors and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess I generally thought of that as being like this very shady like backdoor thing or or people who weren't re- real writers mm-hmm. and that's not the case like there are great writers who just like because everybody needs to make money and like sometimes you're working on a passion project that's right. like, gonna take five years and like you have kids or whatever um or you just have rent so you do a movie that is bad and you just make it as good as it can be knowing that's gonna be what it is and like that's fine i used to i think i, I working in the industry has also like changed how much i i judge actors for like what they do mm, i have a how lot so? like I, I have a lot less judgment of like people who do shitty movies. I'm just like, I know that it seems like actors have like all of the money in the world, and obviously they have a lot of it. But actors also work crazy hard, and part of the reason that they're able to do some of the great stuff they do is because they do the shitty stuff. Because the right. great stuff is usually risk risky, and it often isn't going to make money. Mm-hmm. And most of the stuff that's like sure things in terms of making money are shitty projects. Like, I and also like they work really hard. That's their job. Like. 
And it's not their fault if we all go to see like Kitten's Christmas mm. 3. Like it's that's us. It's like, like if a... we're going to go watch it, like why should they not do it? They yeah. know what they're doing. They're not like walking out like I'm this is my masterpiece. Like it's like uh, Simu Liu uh, when everyone was roasting him for being in the uh, Shutterstock photos. It's right. like, I'm like, but also like, yeah, if you're dude, if you're like a beginner actor, yeah, oh, for you're sure, anything like, you, have you ever? Did you ever notice this when we were like younger when TV with commercials was a thing? <laughs> but like when you would see a commercial actor on like a well-known commercial, mm-hmm. and then a few years later they would be in a TV show, and you'd be like, wow, oh they yeah, made yeah, that it. was such a thing. Yeah, yeah, and then and then also that now, I mean. It's funny because even as I say this, like, I do still have that just, like, it's so ingrained that, like, judgy, like, oh, well, if you're in, like, in a successful actor, like, you know, does, like, a makeup series of ads yeah. or something. It's so hard not, and it's also, but it's also, like, why shouldn't they, like, they, actors, I will say this, like, especially successful mm-hmm. actors, like, there's a lot of, like, yes, they have a, they get, like, they get a lot of money and, and stuff, but the amount of scrutiny that their bodies and faces are under, men too, like women yeah. I, more, but like men as well. Mm-hmm. I think it's, I did not, and I still will never fully appreciate how, like what it is like to live your life where your body is your commodity. Yeah. And like where anytime your body changes, even if it's like what we would consider positive, like even like losing weight, like anything, even on a day-to-day basis mm-hmm. affects people like if you lose water weight on a tv show and your costume doesn't fit that affects people that costs money like think of it like like literally Whoa. day to day like the actors and performers especially per- per- successful ones of all body types live with their body is their commodity and so much pressure that like if they want to make money off their commodity by selling makeup like i'm kind of like I still have the judgment, but I'm trying to get rid of it because, like, yeah. that is their product. Like, it's not like effortless. Like, they live such control. They have to live like such intense lives, and like, that's so much pressure. That's so fascinating. It's almost like it's like it's not. I mean, it's in no way obviously. It's no in no way comparable to being in the military, right? But I'm trying like to think of. It's nothing like that. But I'm just trying Support to think of another troops. thing. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of another thing where like another profession where your job and your body are and your like ability to physically do tasks are so connected that like if yeah. you fuck up your body it's not gonna just fuck up you it's gonna fuck up many people that's i guess that's like why you hear about i mean it makes sense why so many actors and actresses just have like insane nutritional regimen right because how could they not like you, you could not eat like a normal person right you like if you're trying to be look the same on a very successful tv show like, for over years, months yeah years exactly it's like you're gonna be waking up working out for the same exact amount of time and eating the same types of meals right for the whole time because we, yeah and we and we see that like all, again across all body types i mean like when people lose weight, that can be a problem. That's a problem too. Like, oh, yeah. you don't look as funny at this weight. You don't look like you'd be with this part. Oh, like, I'm blanking on his name. It's crazy. From uh, Jonah Hill. Yeah, like, yeah. Her prime example, and also the guy who played Newman on Seinfeld. Yeah. When Seinfeld ended, he lost a ton of weight, but no one wanted him anymore. Right, because he's not. Yeah, there. It's we have this. Yeah. So I can't remember how we got on this, but yes, I do stand by that. I've I've definitely <laughs> like grown infinitely in my like respect for how much work actors and performers mm. put into their bodies yeah and that it is work that like it's easy to look at it and think of it as vanity mm. but it is just like just like i believe that like again not the same thing but like just like i believe like sex work is work mm. like work that is maintaining your body for a specific purpose is absolutely work. Totally. And it's not it's not vanity. Like it's not having a nutritional coach when you are like a movie star is a job thing. It's yeah. not a like I want to be pretty thing. They may also want be like that. I'm not saying they're not, but like you can't function otherwise. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, I know it's we like there's so much that we look at that of that, I think that was just like misplaced as like, oh, they could just be normal people. It's like, no, they couldn't. We wouldn't yeah. like not not even we wouldn't like them, but it would be expensive. Yeah, it would cost money. Wow, and like what you said with like costume refits, right? 
great. <laughs> I was just thinking, I was like, imagine you're like Disney Studios, right? And then Robert Don- Downey Jr. puts on like 30 pounds and you have to rebuild the Iron Man suit but, or something like. And that's why so many, I mean, yeah. and I don't like this, but this is this is true. That's why so many actors' contracts have um, clauses about that forbid them from changing changing their bodies, aka like gaining or losing weight. Wow. Yeah. Or getting tattoos or like altering their appearance. Mm. Okay. And models, obviously, even more so. I mean, th- that's to the nth degree because you're literally a specific size. So I think if there's anybody more than actress, it's, it's models. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So in your in your time as a script coordinator, do you ever interface with the actors on the show? Yeah, yeah, I do. And um, I've been, I, I think I've been pretty lucky. I, I, I've never interacted with an actor who was like shitty. Um, and I've had interacted with many actors who were great. Nice. Um, so, what 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 capacity do you interact with them in, or do you? So, script coordinator more I'd say than writer assistant because script coordinator sends out the script. So, I literally am the person when I'm script coordinating. I'm literally sending the scripts. Right, um, right. And so, like on Maisel, I'm not the script coordinator. On Maisel, I'm the, I'm the writer assistant. But our our script coordinator Grace, who again, like fantastic, she like we on Maisel we tend to get scripts very very late, very close to deadlines, and so this she has quite a bit of contact with the with some of the main actors because like if there's going to be a change to their dialogue and it's shooting tomorrow Mm -hmm. like if it's a a major actor with a lot of lines she's texting them when we get it like she's supposed to like Mm -hmm. we get like she and i will get the script for proofing and we'll be like oh shit like mar and like the mom's like this line these like whole page like change and this shoots in two days and or this shoots tomorrow and she has this call time so grace will literally like text mar and be like hey heads up this is coming like so she has a lot, a lot of if, and that is more often the case if you're on a show where the the scripts come in later. Wow. Um, no script coordinator on billions, that would happen, but a little less. Mm-hmm. Um, but it did, it definitely did happen. Um, so wait, what shows have you been on? So the first one was Welcome to the Wayne was the Nickelodeon show, and then I worked, I went from there to billions. I script okay. coordinated for one season for season three, and then I was writer's assistant for season four, and mm-hmm. I went from there to Maisel season three, mm-hmm. and then from there I worked on this. Um, great Hulu anthology series called Monsterland. I encourage everyone to watch it mm-hmm. um, by Mary Laws. Genius. Genius. Amazing. Amazing writer. Amazing showrunner. Um, and then Maisel season four. And mm-hmm. then now I'm working on, it's a new Apple project. Um, so NDA. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, completely. It's not, it's not greenlit. So the, it's a new Apple project. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've had that before. I had Belton. I don't know if you know Belton, but he, oh, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he's an office PA right now, but <laughs> we had to NDA a piece of the episode. <laughs> yeah. I was, like, I was like, yeah. So that's interesting. So for you, and we're actually a little over time here. Oh yeah. I'm realizing I actually, yeah, I should probably, yeah. yeah. But uh, in your, in your like uh, career in this, what's your end goal? Are you trying to be a writer? Or, I want to be like, writer. I want to be a showrunner. Show eventually. Runner. Eventually I want to be okay. a showrunner, but yeah, the next kind of thing that I want to do in my career is def- is be staffed. It's a very, very like right. kind of clear. Cause thing. like a staff writer is like, once you're like, that's like, the lowest level of, of writer. Right. Oh, staff writer, a staff writer is the lowest level of writer actually. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, but yeah. that's like the first one where you're like a permanent. That's where you are. That's where you machine. are a writer. Yeah. Right. That's where you join the writer's guild. Okay. Uh, but yeah, staff writer is, is the lowest. Um, and then you go up from there, like store, story editor, executive, and then you get into producing. Nice. Stuff. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And yeah. how do people mostly get into that through the track you've taken, like through writing assistant work? It's a very or? controversial subject right now, especially in the assistant community. Okay. Um, I've seen. I've seen. There's understandably a lot of frustration of, among people who that doesn't happen for. Right. Um, and I know there's some people. There was an article recently that was like the assistant to writer track is is dead. I don't. I don't think that's true. Maybe that's true. It might be more true in LA than it is in New York. Okay. New York's a little different because we're such a, so much smaller. Every show I've worked on has been in New York, which okay. is very, very unusual. Yeah. Um, I have five, I have five friends and I know two other, I know two other people who've all been staffed from assistant positions. So like, mm-hmm. I'm inclined to say like, it's not dead, but almost all of those were in New York. So right. I don't know about LA. Um, one of the other ways, major ways people get is big contests. Um, and fellowships that is that is a very big thing okay. especially because i believe some fellowships actually pay for the salary of the first staff writing gig it's part of like an incentive to get people to hire you like okay. because then the show doesn't have to pay you i don't i don't know the details about okay that. Yeah. um that or like people who get on the blacklist which is like the list basically of like the best it's the industry list of the best 
uh, screenplays that were not made this year. Mm. Um, or people interesting to call it the blacklist to <laughs> be like, yeah, it's a very, well, it's a yeah. very, it's an all, yeah, it's a. It's a like, very these old. are the people to never hire. Despite I know how much it's they a, work. especially because it's a Hollywood thing. Like the blacklist yeah. is obviously goes yeah. back, <laughs> but um, that big big prizes and some people who are um, and then I think and I'm sure like comics and performers know this. People who have really big have have separate careers that make them really interesting like sometimes right. journalists who are like like great journalists who have really had like a career they can bring something especially mm-hmm. to a sh- like on billions i think they would do that or like playwrights sometimes can bring like mazel had several like professional playwrights who would actually at least one had never worked in a tele- tv show before and she w- mm. worked four seasons she's like amazing interesting um that i think that in fact playwriting now i don't know if this is kind of shifting now since the pandemic but in before the pandemic at least there was definitely it was a kind of a trend of hiring playwrights into tv rooms because hmm. because they realized that playwrights can write really good dialogue okay and yeah um wow this is all so fascinating <laughs> yeah it's but it's it's and um oh and the other thing is like and then people who get who get famous for performance like some like comics who are who are really really good like you know who, right um people who work in late night sometimes mm. um um just kind of variety, but yeah, like... Yeah, sometimes people who, who make, you know, people who make their stuff mm-hmm. and get a little bit of traction. Okay. Um, like people who make stuff that's at, at a lower budget and then it gets attention. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, that's kind of encouraging. There's like a lot of ways in it. Yeah, not there's just, definitely a lot yeah. of ways. Okay, interesting. All right, so we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to wrap up here. Yeah. I, I got you, I got you. Um, this is the question that I ask everybody. Okay. In your creative career of writing, do you have a theme or a message that you stick to, not in the work you create, but in something you tell yourself to keep you going? Like, do you have a motivation or something that you, mm. that, like when you wake up in the morning to do a long day and then maybe write something yourself, what, what keeps you going? Um, I guess, I mean, I think it's, it, it, honestly, it's the, it's the same feeling that I have, like, when I was talking about when I was in high school and the first time that, like, I saw my stuff, like, on stage, mm-hmm. like, that feeling is just, like, it's, there's not, it's, I would describe it as, like, when you're a little kid, like, you know how you feel, like, on holidays, like, Christmas, like, when you still believe in, like, Santa Claus or whatever, like, that kind of feeling of, like, magic. Yeah. It, that is, I think, the, to me, either, as a, as a comic, either being on stage and doing well, or as a writer, being in a, a room or watching people do something that you had in your head, make it real, mm-hmm. is the closest to that feeling you have when you're a kid that I've ever had. Okay. I, I love that. That's wonderful. A little yeah. bit of magic and to see Yeah, that. I know that's how I like hate saying it like that, but like that is that is the closest thing I can think of is like that thing that you have when you're a kid that like you you think you can't ever have again. Right. Okay. That's wonderful. I think that's yeah. um <laughs> that makes me want to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Thank you so much for coming on. This yeah, was a this fascinating was episode. I, I think the listeners will really appreciate this because, once again, one it's one of those industries that's like it feels so impenetrable totally. into what actually goes on, except for the people who are inside it. So Yeah, thank you. and if it helps, even the people inside feel that way too. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thank you for coming on, sharing it, everything, and giving us some insight here. Um, where can people find, find you? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter and Instagram, both at, at Juliana with two N's. Maher, M A H E R. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also on TikTok. I think at that too. <laughs> but I, I, I post some comedy stuff. I should do that more. Okay, so go follow Juliana and um, check her out on any of her shows. Um, and uh, yeah, go watch Miss Maisel. <laughs> yeah, go watch. Go watch. Also watch Monsterland. Also great, underrated show. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on. Guys, that is the episode for this week. I will catch you all later. Tune in for another episode if you want more. I'll talk to you next week. Bye.